32 years after the Dark Portal first opened, Gul'dan stood before the Tomb of Sargeras, a place of legend in the Warcraft lore, of great power, but more so than he, or we, even knew at the time. From there, he opened a portal through which innumerable demons would pour. Soon, we found ourselves standing before the defeated avatar of Sargaris, our leaders left with a choice. To close the portal, or to charge through, cut the head off the snake, and frankly, make Legion turbo goddamn cool in how hard it went. They chose the latter. We defeated Kill Jaden, deprived the Legion of their grand tactician, and then we took the fight to Argus, ending Sargeras' burning crusade. And with that, you would think that the story is over. You would think there's no reason to go back to the tomb of Sargeras beyond hunting for treasures. But that is not the case. I am here today for a reason, because something is happening. Zalatath, a character who we first met during the Legion expansion, is returning to the game. Harbinger of the Void Lords, the driving force of the World Soul Saga. And as you just heard at the start of this video, she had a lot to say about the Tomb of Sargaris. Words that are more relevant now than they were back then, because Blizzard have directly pulled today's mystery into Dragonflight, by a bit of an easter egg, but one that was very clear, and with its timing, very suspicious. So today we unearth one of Warcraft's great mysteries, what lies beneath the tomb of Sargaris. I know one thing that it isn't though, it's not today's sponsor. Boot.dev, they're awesome, and they're going to teach you backend web development, which is an amazing skill. You're going to be learning it with Python and Go, and they do it in a way that's actually smart, by making it fun. You see, they're an online self-paced platform that's 100% designed to get you writing code, and not just any code. You'll be working through role-playing game-inspired problems. And Boot itself has got quests, levels, XP, achievements, and you can get 25% off your first purchase by using my code. Now, in the past, I've talked about their pragmatic approach. Another thing I want to talk about is how pro-consumer they are. 30-day, no questions asked, money-back guarantee. For each course, they have a free interactive demo, and they even go as far as to have a guest mode where you can watch and read all of their content. And after that, if you want the interactivity, you can pay for a membership. So I think that's just them putting, you know, putting it where their mouth is, really. So you can check out what they are all about, and when you're ready, well, you can give them a shot. You'll write a ton of code, and you'll write code that actually teaches you skills that will be useful on the job. Being real, when I started coding 12 years ago, oh yeah, I really do wish Boot existed back then. But the good news for you is they exist right now and you can check them out at boot.dev forward slash bellular. Over there, the code bellular will get you 25% off your first purchase. And of course that's backed by their no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So cheers Boot, and that's rolled. Before it was a tomb, it was a temple, one from which the high priestesses of Alun led elven spiritual life. And by the time of these events, around 10,000 years ago, the Night Elves reigned rather supreme. Their empire covered the vast majority of Kalimdor, which they thought to be Azeroth's only continent, though we now know otherwise. And while life at the temple and the city that housed at Suramar may have been going well, the same could not have been said for their capital. Once called Elundris, it was renamed to Zinishari in honor of their queen Ashara. And in case shenanigans like that don't make it clear enough, excess and ego had became the norm in high society, eventually leading to such misuse of the Well of Eternity's arcane energies that Azeroth glowed radiantly in the cosmos. So radiantly that they drew the attention, so the lore went, of Sargaris, leader of the Burning Legion. Now, he had long known of Azeroth. He had known of Azeroth's importance, but he didn't know where she was located. That changed, and luring a shower with promises of power, he began what we now call the War of the Ancients. And as this war dragged on, the Highborn of Suramar grew ever more worried. They eventually thwarted a Legion plan to open a second portal at the Temple of Elune, and after they thwarted the plan, they used the Pillars of Creation to seal it shut. You may ask why the Legion went for the temple, and you'll find out soon. The point is, with the temple now safe, their leader Alessand made a grim determination to withdraw to the city, 
to seal it shut and leave the world to its fate. So using the eye of Amunthul, one of these pillars of creation, just ancient Titan artifacts, very powerful, she created the Nightwell, a font of immense power that essentially did operate like the Sunwell. And it would both sustain her people and the vast shield she formed around the city, a shield so strong it withstood the calamitous event that marked the war's ending known as the Sundering. It was sparked by the Well of Eternity's implosion and saw the whole continent shatter. Suramar held firm, the Temple of Elune did not. And while it was part of Suramar City, it actually lay out on the island of Thaldranath, relying on a great bridge for access to the city. So, without the Great Shield's protection, it fell beneath the ocean. Thousands of years would pass. The Night Elves would recover, the High Elves would splinter off. Humanity goes and forms its first kingdom. We see Dalaran, the Kirin Tor, magical collaboration between High Elves and humanity. It's all far, far too much to cover in one video right now, so here's what's relevant for today. Given all of the spooky demonic threats that just happened to be about, the Council of Tirasfall is formed. And the deal is, this council empowers a guardian, right? That guardian gets a share of all of the power of the Archmages who are in the council. That guardian then wields that power to defend the world against threats that are just too great for conventional means. Now, you probably know the last guardian, it's Medivh. But his mother is also a massively important character. She's less in the Warcraft games, but she is immensely important in the canon. She's easily the most powerful guardian of Tirasfall that there was. Now, probably her most famous story sets her against Targaris's avatar. She ends up defeating it, and fearing that this avatar could one day be restored, she locks it somewhere that she feels is truly safe, and that is beneath the waves of the Broken Isles, deep in the Temple of Elune, a place that still was guarded by those magical, fell-resistant seals from the Pillars of Creation, as of course done by the Night Elves all the way back in the War of the Ancients. And along with that, she also buries the Eye and Jeweled Scepter of Sargeras, super powerful items that she knew had to be locked away safe. Now, of course, Aegwyn was a little bit played. Sargaris actually lingered within her body and failing to corrupt her, his essence uh, slipped into Medivh. And while we didn't know it when Warcraft 1 came out in 1994, basically that was a campaign that was meant to pave the way for the Legion's takeover of Azeroth. From that point, we've got three main appearances of the tomb in the Warcraft canon before we hit World of Warcraft. Quite simply, two of them are in Warcraft 2. The third one is in Warcraft 3. Essentially, Gul'dan diverts, right, a bunch of the army to go and get all of that great power locked away in the tomb. He then gets killed. Later on, other horde go there to fetch some super powerful items. And then, in Warcraft 3, Maiev thwarts Illidan's attempt to go and pick up the Eye of Sargeras, and that leads to a whole bunch of destruction. That's a massive TLDR, but basically, we're now at the Legion expansion. And this is when we get into the immense secrets. During Legion's Alatath was merely our Naifu. She was absolutely beloved, right? People went mad for her, but she was not really seen as an expansion-driving character. Which, well, she very much is right now. Even before we would set foot in the Tomb of Sargeras raid, she set her expectations. And not just with one voice line, no, with a few. And first, let's do a refresher. This, this was always a place of power. Aegwyn was drawn here, and before her, the elves, and before them, the trolls, <laughs> and before them. With how she says that, there's obviously something before the trolls. The answer to that is, of course, the Titans, or at the very least, the Titan Forged. We obviously know Azeroth is dotted with installations, and toward the end of the Tomb of Sargeras raid, it becomes very obvious that, uh, well, the Tomb of Sargeras is one of those Titan installations. After placing the pillars, we enter a place called the Sanctum of the Guardian. Now, it's named after Aegwyn, who basically had shacked up there after the Council of Tirasfall, worked out she was going a bit rogue, and they found Karazhan. So, she hides out there, but she obviously didn't build it. Look around, it is clearly of titanic construction, it's full of Watchers, and those Watchers are named Aeonic Defenders. Aeonic, that certainly makes me think of Elun and Aenar, probably the latter, and we'll get back to that a little later in today's video. Now, to reach the Fallen Avatar, we descend a vast, vast distance. We go past ancient bones of a great beast, and then we hit it. We hit more Titan structures. Ominous faces glowing with what appears to be holy power. And yeah, holy, because if you run into these similarly colored orbs, 
what does your character take? Your character takes holy damage. And big picture, this installation is a marvel. Its scale is vast. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this whole thing was built as a prison for the avatar of Sargeras. But that's obviously impossible, because this structure predates Aegwyn's defeat of the avatar by tens of thousands of years. And that means that its original purpose was very different. Egoin just knew it was super powerful and it was sealed using the Pillars of Creation. Therefore, it's a really good place to lock up a big, dangerous, spooky thing. So, when we go below, we even see this, a strange piece of Titan machinery that looks remarkably similar to the Eye of Amunthul. What is it doing? Is it drawing power out of the World Soul? Is it infusing the World Soul with Arcane? <laughs> right now, we don't know. But this story does, in fact, go even deeper. Let's have a listen to another whisper. That fell edifice towering over this land pales in comparison to the grandeur of what stood here long ago. Okay, so Zalatath would obviously not call a Titan installation grand. That means she's speaking of before the Titans arrived on Azeroth. She is talking about the Black Empire. And if it's not already obvious that she's talking about that, well, this next whisper makes it very obvious. It was here in ages past that the God of the Deep lost a great battle to the God of Seven Heads. But as was so often the case, even defeat ultimately worked in Nazoth's favor. So piecing it together, Nazoth was defeated by Yasharj in this area. This is a spot where grandeur used to stand during the days of the Black Empire, and it's also an area that she tells us is a place of power. Now, Zalatath is involved in The War Within. Likely, she'll have a role in Midnight. This all may be rather alarming, and if you think that the developers perhaps have forgotten about this link, you'd be dead wrong. We didn't know it at the time, but patch 10.1.5 in a way is the start of the World Soul Saga. It's that moment where Riddikron stops being an expansion level threat, where he ascends to being the guy whose plan is to empower Zalatath so that she may try to claim Azeroth, all in a gambit to draw the Titans to Azeroth so he can get his personal revenge. Quite the plan. This of course is a patch that was more than just a dungeon, it also added the Time Rifts feature along with a bunch of new rares, and one of these is about to make a massive difference. This mob is called Zalkir the Chosen, Maw of Catanth. Defeat him and you'll find this, the Black Blade of Catanth. Black Blade, maybe you think that's similar to Zalatath Blade of the Black Empire, but that's not really the point. The point is Catanth. What is Catanth? Well, glad you asked. I don't believe these lands have seen such carnage since the battle for Catan. Such a long time ago. Zalatath whispered that into our heads as we walked the broken shore. This battle for Catanth. What was Catanth? I mean, so far we don't really know. We know that something grand once stood there, something far more impressive than the now fell corrupted Temple of Elune. So what was Catanth? Was Catanth a installation? Was it a big, you know, building thing? Was it a nation? We literally do not know. But whatever it was, we know it was powerful, powerful enough for Yasharj to fight Nizoth. So you might then be thinking, right, how the hell are we going to draw all of this together and have it actually be relevant to where the game is going? Well. The answer is, it's really simple. Something's down there. Old gods fought over it. Titanforge beat them back. Then they built a facility deep within the earth, maybe going right down to this place of power. After that, trolls were drawn there. Trolls being drawn there is interesting because elves were drawn there as well. And think about elves and trolls. The waters of the Well of Eternity are what slowly turn the trolls into the elves. I think them being drawn to this location as well, maybe that makes us think about this being something essential to Azeroth herself. I mean, that would kind of make sense. Where was the first big portal placed during the War of the Ancients? It was at the Well of Eternity. They tried to open a second one at the Temple of Elun. Why did they do that? Well, I think because of whatever power is there. Or at least that is one, I think, very solid theory. But there are other ways to cut this. The elves obviously dedicated it to their goddess, Elune, and that, along with another part of Legion, makes me suspicious. So, do you remember how the Shadow Priest could interact with the font of Elune near the sisters' encounter, and if the Shadow Priest does that, they just instantly get killed? 
That is also where we hear the voice line that Elune is an upstart goddess in the eyes of Zalatath. And that's kind of interesting to me because it means Elune has clearly got purchase in this place. She just deleted the Shadow Priest. Now, do you remember Antorus, where we see Elune and Aenar appear to be connected? All of the speculation we did back in the day about the Tear of Elune. And then just recently in Guardians of the Dream, we found a book detailing the history of Elune Ahir, like the first big world tree. Now, we've talked about it a fair few times in the channel. I'm not going to completely go over all of it, but the core part is in that story, we learn that Elune and Aenar are very close. It's kind of implied that Amethyl doesn't approve at the very least, if Elune is a being of life, then Amunthul sort of would see her as a threat. Thing is, though, look back to the Guardian Sanctum, where we see these Aeonic Defenders, or Eonic Defenders, that make us think of names like Elune and Aenar, in this case, most likely, Aenar. Now, in that story, Elune gives Aenar a branch, Aenar plants that in Azeroth, Amunthul is very angry, he rips it out, but he doesn't know that the roots are still left down there. So another way you could take this, then, is that this facility is perhaps constructed on Aenar's orders, perhaps relayed through Freya. It could be that. Maybe the place of power is actually a root of Eluna here that is deep beneath the tree. That could be it. Maybe that's what the old gods are fighting over. Or perhaps it's a facility related to Azeroth's world soul. And that's the type of energy that we're dealing with down there. We can't confirm these yet, but I think that is really two very solid theories on what's going down and why the Tomb of Sargeras is actually relevant to us with our current day lore. I mean, hell, even just think about this. What did they do in the Tear Quest line most recently in Dragonflight? They re-established Elisond as a character, right? She went through that time portal. What is going to happen there? I then think Midnight is a very elf-driven expansion. Suramar seems to have something going on related to the world soul. They just, you know, they just told us about Elisant. So they're drawing our attention to these parts of Legion. And then, most obviously, we have in the very patch of Dragonflight, they kicked off the world soul saga, uh, you know, driving events with Zalatath and Riddicron. That is the very patch where Blizzard drew our attention to Catanth. And we know that Catanth is directly related to the tomb of Zargaris. So, Hello, Blizzard. If trying to tie these things together is your intent, then I think it's really cool. I think if you want to link expansion areas together and weave a story through both old and new, then that is way better than just purely making new shit up. I absolutely loved piecing this video together, and I think we now have a very coherent theory of how the Tomb of Sargeras is a little bit suspicious. The sorts of secrets or discoveries that we may learn in relation to it, and perhaps, uh, well, some future storylines. I think it's pretty neat. What do you think? Of course, if you're interested in this sort of lore topic, you gotta check out this video. It's also got a lot of Zalatath. Uh, yes, why is she the Harbinger? Who is the, she the, the Harbinger of? What does it all mean? What's going on with the Chamber of the Heart? Those are relevant. You can find out about them in that video. Enjoy. I'll see you next time.